Chapter 9 of A Confession by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Almer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A contradiction arose from which there were two exits. Either that which I called reason was not so rational as I supposed, or that which seemed to me irrational was not so irrational as I supposed. And I began to verify the line of argument of my rational knowledge. Verifying the line of argument of rational knowledge, I found it quite correct. The conclusion that life is nothing was inevitable. But I noticed a mistake. The mistake lay in this, that my reasoning was not in accord with the question I had put. The question was, why should I live, that is to say, what real permanent result will come out of my illusory, transitory life? What meaning has my finite existence in this infinite world? And to reply to that question, I had studied life. The solution of all the possible questions of life could evidently not satisfy me. For my question, simple as it first appeared, included a demand for an explanation of the finite in terms of the infinite, and vice versa. I asked, what is the meaning of my life beyond time, cause, and space? And I replied to quite another question, what is the meaning of my life within time, cause, and space? With the result that, after a long effort of thought, the answer I reached was none. In my reasonings, I constantly compared, nor could I do otherwise, the finite with the finite, and the infinite with the infinite. But for that reason, I reached the inevitable result. Force is force, matter is matter, will is will, the infinite is the infinite, nothing is nothing, and that was all that could result. It was something like what happens in mathematics when thinking to solve an equation we find we are working on an identity. The line of reasoning is correct, but the result is the answer that a equals a, or x equals x, or 0 equals 0. The same thing happened with my reasoning in relation to the question of the meaning of my life. The reply given by all science to the question only result in identity. And really, strictly scientific knowledge, that knowledge which begins, as Descartes did, with complete doubt about everything, rejects all knowledge admitted on faith and builds everything afresh on the laws of reason and experience, and cannot give any other reply to the question of life than that which I obtained, an indefinite reply. Only at first had it seemed to me that knowledge had given a positive reply, the reply of Schopenhauer, that life has no meaning and is an evil. But on examining the matter, I understood that the reply is not positive. It was only my feeling that so expressed it. Strictly expressed, as it is by Brahmins and by Solomon and Schopenhauer, the reply is merely indefinite, or an identity. Null equals null. Life is nothing. So that philosophic knowledge denies nothing, but only replies that the question cannot be solved by it, that for it the solution remains indefinite. Having understood this, I understood that it was not possible to seek in rational knowledge for a reply to my question, and that the reply given by rational knowledge is a mere indication that a reply can only be obtained by a different statement of the question and only when the relation of the finite to the infinite is included in that question. And I understood that however irrational and distorted might be the replies given by faith, they have this advantage, that they introduce into every answer a relation between the finite and the infinite, without which there can be no solution. In whatever way I stated the question, that relation appeared in the answer. How am I to live? According to the law of God. What real result will come of my life? Eternal torment or eternal bliss? What meaning has life that death does not destroy? Union with the eternal God, heaven. So that besides rational knowledge, which it seemed to me the only knowledge, I was inevitably brought to acknowledge that all live humanity has another irrational knowledge, faith, which makes it possible to live. Faith still remained to me as irrational as it was before, but I could not but admit that it alone gives mankind a reply to the questions of life, and that consequently it makes life possible. Reasonable knowledge had brought me to acknowledge that life is senseless, and my life had come to a halt, and I wished to destroy myself. Looking around on the whole of mankind, I saw that people live and declare that they know the meaning of life. I looked at myself. I had lived as long as I knew a meaning of life, and it made life possible. Looking again at people of other lands, and my contemporaries and their predecessors, I saw the same thing. Where there is life, there since man began faith has made life possible for him. And the chief outline of that faith is everywhere and always identical. Whatever that faith may be, and whatever answers it might give, to whomsoever it gives them, every such answer gives to the finite existence of man an infinite meaning, a meaning not destroyed by sufferings, deprivations, or death. That means that only in faith can we find for life a meaning and a possibility. What, then, is this faith? And I understood that faith is not merely the evidence of things not seen, etc., and it is not a revelation, that defines only one of the indications of faith, it is not a relation of man to God, one has first to define faith and then God, and not faith through God, it is not only the agreement with what one has been told, 
But faith is a knowledge of the meaning of human life, in consequence of which man does not destroy himself but lives. Faith is the strength of life. If a man lives, he believes in something. If he did not believe that one must live for something, he would not live. If he does not see and recognize the illusory nature of the finite, he believes in the finite. If he understands the illusory nature of the finite, he must believe in the infinite. Without faith, he cannot live. And I recalled the whole course of my mental labor and was horrified. It was now clear to me that for man to be able to live, he must either not see the infinite or have such an explanation of the meaning of life as will connect the finite with the infinite. Such an explanation I had had, but as long as I believed in the finite, I did not need the explanation, and I began to verify it by reason. And in the light of reason, the whole of my former explanation flew to atoms. But a time came when I ceased to believe in the finite, and then I began to build up rational foundations, out of which I knew an explanation would bring me to the meaning of life. But nothing could I build. Together with the best of human intellect, I reached the conclusion that null equals null, and was much astonished at that conclusion though nothing else could have resulted. What was I doing when I sought an answer in the experimental sciences? I wished to know why I lived, and for this purpose studied all that is outside me. Evidently I might learn much, but nothing of what I needed. What was I doing when I sought an answer in philosophical knowledge? I was studying the thoughts of those who had found themselves in the same position as I, lacking a reply to the question, why do I live? Evidently I could learn nothing but what I knew myself, namely that nothing can be known. What am I? a part of the infinite. In those few words lie the whole problem. Is it possible that humanity has only put that question to itself since yesterday? And can no one before me have set himself that question, a question so simple, and one that springs to the tongue of every wise child? Surely that question has been asked since man began, and naturally for the solution of that question since man began, it has been equally insufficient to compare the finite with the finite and the infinite with the infinite. And since man began, the relation of the infinite to the finite has been sought out and expressed. All these conceptions in which the finite has been adjusted to the infinite and a meaning found for life, the conception of God, of will, of goodness, we submit to logical examination. And all those conceptions fail to stand to reason's criticism. Were it not so terrible, it would be ludicrous with what pride and self-satisfaction we, like children, pull the watch to pieces, take out the spring, and make a toy of it, and are then surprised when the watch does not go. A solution of the contradiction between the finite and the infinite, and such a reply of the question of life as will make it possible to live, is necessary and precious. And that is the only solution where we find everywhere, always and among all people. A solution descending from times in which we lose sight of the life of man. A solution so difficult that we can compose nothing like it. And this solution we lightheartedly destroy in order to again to set the same question, which is natural to everyone and to which we have no answer. The conception of an infinite God, the divinity of the soul, the connection of human affairs with God, the unity and existence of the soul, man's conception of moral goodness and of evil, are conceptions formulated in the hidden infinity of human thought. They are those conceptions without which neither life nor I should exist. Yet rejecting all that labor of the whole of humanity, I wish to remake it afresh myself, and in my own manner. I did not then think like that, but the germs of these thoughts were already in me. I understood in the first place that my position with Schopenhauer and Solomon, notwithstanding our wisdom, was stupid. We see that life is an evil and yet continue to live. That is evidently stupid, for if life is senseless and I am so fond of what is reasonable, it should be destroyed, and then there would be no one to challenge it. Secondly, I understood that all one's reasonings turned in a vicious cycle like a wheel out of gear with its pinion. However much and however well we may reason, we cannot obtain a reply to the question, and null will always equal null and therefore our path is probably erroneous. Thirdly, I began to understand that in the replies given by faith is stored up the deepest of human wisdom, and that I had no right to deny them on the ground of reason, and that those answers are the only ones which reply to life's question. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of A Confession by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Almer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I understood this, but it made matters no better for me. I was now ready to accept any faith, if only it did not demand of me a direct denial of reason, which would have been a falsehood. And I studied Buddhism and Mohammedanism from books, and most of all I studied Christianity, both from books and from the people around me. Naturally, I first of all turned to the orthodox of my circle, to the people who were learned, to church theologians, monks, to theologians of the newest shade, and even to evangelicals, who profess salvation by belief in the redemption. And I seized on these believers and questioned them as to their beliefs and their understanding of the meaning of life. 
but though I made all possible concessions and avoided all disputes, I could not accept the faith of these people. I saw that what they gave out as their faith did not explain the meaning of life, but obscured it, and that they themselves affirmed their belief not to answer the question of life which brought me to faith, but for some other aims alien to me. I remember the painful feeling of fear of being thrown back into my former state of despair after the hope I had often and often experienced in my intercourse with these people. The more fully they explained to me their doctrines, the more clearly did I perceive their error and realize that my hope of finding in their belief an explanation of the meaning of life was vain. It was not that in their doctrines they mixed many unnecessary and unreasonable things with Christian truths that had always been near to me. That was not what repelled me. I was repelled by the fact that these people's lives were like my own, with only this difference, that such a life did not correspond to the principles they expounded in their teachings. I clearly felt that they deceived themselves and that they, like myself, found no other meaning in life than to live while life lasts, taking all one's hands can seize. I saw this because if they had had a meaning which destroyed the fear of loss, suffering, and death, they would not have feared these things. But they, these believers of our circle, just like myself, lived in sufficiency and superfluity, trying to increase to preserve them, feared privations, suffering, and death, just like myself and all of us non-believers, lived to satisfy their desires, and lived just as badly, if not worse, than the unbelievers. No arguments could convince me of the truth of their faith. Only deeds which showed that they saw a meaning in life making what was so dreadful to me, poverty, sickness, and death, not dreadful to them, could convince me and such deeds I did not see among various believers of our circle. On the contrary, I saw such deeds done by the people of our circle who were the most unbelieving, but never by those so-called believers. And I understood that the belief of these people was not the faith I sought, and that their faith is not a real faith, but an Epicurean consolation in life. I understood that that faith may serve, if not for a consolation, then at least as some distraction for a repentant Solomon upon his deathbed. But it cannot serve for the great majority of mankind, who are called out not to amuse themselves while consuming the labor of others, but to create life. For all humanity to be able to live and continue to live attributing a meaning to life, they, those millards, must have a different, real knowledge of faith. Indeed, it was not the fact that we, with Solomon and Schopenhauer, did not kill ourselves that convinced me of the existence of faith, but the fact that those millards of people have lived and are living, and have bored Solomon and us on the current of their lives and I began to draw nearer to those believers among the poor, simple, unlettered folk, pilgrims, monks, sectarians, and peasants. The faith of these common people was the same Christian faith as was professed by the pseudo-believers of our circle. Among them, too, I found a great deal of superstition mixed with the Christian truths, but the difference was that the superstitions of the believers of our circle were quite unnecessary to them and were not in conformity with their lives, being merely a kind of Epicurean diversion. But the superstitions of the believers among the laboring masses conformed so with their lives that it was impossible to imagine them to oneself without these superstitions, which were a necessary condition of their life. The whole life of the believers in our circle was a contradiction of their faith, but the whole life of the working folk believers was a confirmation of the meaning of life which their faith gave them. And I began to look into the meaning of life and faith to these people, and the more I considered it, the more I became convinced that they have a real faith which is necessary to them and alone gives their life a meaning and makes it possible for them to live. In contrast with what I had seen in our circle, where the whole of life is passed in idleness, amusements, and dissatisfaction, I saw that the whole of the life of these people was passed in heavy labor, and that they were content with life. In contradistinction to the way in which people of our circle oppose faith and complain of it on account of deprivations and sufferings, these people accepted illness and sorrow without any perplexity or opposition, and with a quiet, firm conviction that all is good. In contradistinction to us, who the wiser we are, the less we understand the meaning of life and see some evil irony in the fact that we suffer and die, these folks live and suffer, and they approach death and suffering with tranquility, and in the most cases, gladly. In contrast to the fact that a tranquil death, a death without horror and despair, is a very rare exception in our circle, a troubled, rebellious, and unhappy death is the rarest exception among the people. And such people, lacking all that for us and for Solomon is the only good of life, and yet experiencing the greatest happiness, are in a great multitude. I looked more widely around me. I considered the life of the enormous mass of people in the past and the present. And of such people, understanding the meaning of life and able to live and to die, I sought not two or three or tens, but hundreds, thousands, and millions. And they all endlessly differed in their manners, minds, education, and position, as they were all alike in complete contrast to my ignorance, knew the meaning of life and death, labored quietly, endured deprivations and sufferings, lived and died seeing therein not vanity, but good. And I learned to love these people. 
The more I came to know their life, the life of those who are living and of those who are dead by whom I have read and heard, the more I loved them and the easier it became for me to live. So I went on for about two years, and a change took place in me which had long been preparing and the promise of which had always been in me. It came about that the life of our circle, the rich and learned, not merely became distasteful to me, but lost all meaning in my eyes. All our actions, discussions, science, and art presented itself to me in a new light. I understood that it is all merely self-indulgence, and that to find a meaning in it is impossible, while the life of the whole laboring people, the whole of mankind who produce life, appeared to me in its true significance. I understood that that is life itself, and that the meaning given to that life is true, and I accepted it. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of A Confession by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Almer Maud. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. And remembering how those very beliefs had repelled me and had seemed meaningless when professed by people whose lives conflicted with them, and how these same beliefs attracted me and seemed reasonable when I saw that people lived in accord with them, I understood why I had then rejected those beliefs and found them meaningless, and yet now accepted them and found them full of meaning. I understood that I had erred, and why I had erred. I had erred not so much because I thought incorrectly as because I lived badly. I understood that it was not an error in my thought that had hid the truth from me, as much as my life itself and the exceptional conditions of epicurean gratification of desires in which I had passed it. I understood that my question as to what my life is and the answer and evil was quite correct. The only mistake was that the answer referred only to my life, while I had referred to it to life in general. I asked myself what my life is and got the reply. An evil and an absurdity, and really my life, a life of indulgences of desires, was senseless and evil, and therefore the reply, life is evil and an absurdity, referred only to my life, but not to human life in general. I understood the truth which afterwards I found in the Gospel, that men love darkness rather than light, for their works were evil. For everyone that doth ill hateth the light, and cometh not to the light, lest his works should be reproved. I perceive that to understand the meaning of life, it is necessary first that life should not be meaningless and evil, then we can apply reason to explain it. I understood why I had so long wandered round so evident a truth, and that if one is to think and speak of the life of mankind, one must think and speak of that life, and not of the life of some of life's parasites. That truth was always as true as that two and two equal four, but I had not yet acknowledged it, because on admitting two and two to be four, I had also to admit that I was bad and to feel myself to be good was for me more important and necessary than for two and two to be four. I came to love good people, hated myself, and confessed the truth. Now all became clear to me. What if an executioner, passing his whole life in torturing people and cutting off their heads, or a hopeless drunkard, or of a madman settled for life in a dark room which he had followed, and imagines that he would perish if he left? What if he asked himself, what is life? Evidently, he would be able to provide no other reply to that question than that life is the greatest evil, and the madman's answer would be perfectly correct, but only as it applied to himself. What if I am such a madman? What if all we rich and leisured people are such madmen, and I understood that we really are madmen? I, at any rate, was certainly such. And indeed, a bird is so made that it must fly, collect food, and build a nest. And when I see that a bird does this, I have pleasure in its joy. A goat, a hare, and a wolf are so made that they must feed themselves and must breed and feed their family. And when they do so, I feel firmly assured that they are happy, and that their life is a reasonable one. Then what should a man do? He too should provide his living as the animals do, but with this difference, that he will perish if he does it alone. He must obtain it not for himself, but for all. And when he does that, I have a firm assurance that he is happy, and that his life is reasonable. But what had I done during those whole thirty years of my responsible life? Far from producing sustenance for all, I did not even produce it for myself. I lived as a parasite, on asking myself, what is the use of my life? I got the reply, no use. If the meaning of human life lies in supporting it, how could I, who for thirty years had been engaged not on supporting life but on destroying it in myself and in others, how could I obtain any other answer than that my life was senseless and an evil? It was both senseless and an evil. The life of the world endures by someone's will. By the life of the whole world and by our lives, someone fulfills his purpose. To hope to understand the meaning of that will, one must first perform it by doing what is wanted of us. But if I will not do what is wanted of me, I shall never understand what is wanted of me, and still less what is wanted of all of us and of the whole world. If a naked, hungry beggar has been taken to the crossroads, brought into a building belonging to a beautiful establishment, fed, supplied with drink, and obliged to move a handle up and down, evidently before discussing why he was taken, why he should move the handle, 
and whether the whole establishment is reasonably arranged, the beggar should first of all move the handle. If he moves the handle, he will understand that it works a pump, and that the pump draws water, and that the water irrigates the garden beds. Then he will be taken from the pumping station to another place, where he will gather fruits and will enter into the joy of his master, and passing from lower to higher work, will understand more and more of the arrangements of the establishment, and taking part in it will never think to ask why he is there, and certainly will not reproach the master. So those who do his will, the simple, unlearned working folk, whom we regard as cattle, do not reproach the master. But we, the wise, eat the master's food but do not do what the master wishes, and instead of doing it, sit in a circle and discuss, why should that handle be moved? Isn't it stupid? So we have decided. We have decided that the master is stupid or does not exist, and that we are wise. Only we feel that we are quite useless and that we must somehow do away with ourselves. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of A Confession by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Almer Maud This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The consciousness of the error in reasonable knowledge helped me to free myself from the temptation of idle radiocination. The conviction that knowledge of truth can only be found by living led me to doubt the rightness of my life, but I was saved only by the fact that I was able to tear myself from my exclusiveness and to see the real life of the plain working people, and to understand that that alone is real life. I understood that if I wished to understand life and its meaning, I must not live the life of a parasite, but must live a real life, and, taking the meaning given to life by the real humanity and merging myself in that life, verify it. During that time this is what happened to me. During that whole year, when I was asking myself almost every moment whether or not I should end matters with a noose or a bullet, all that time, together with my course of thought and the observation about which I have spoken, my heart was oppressed with a painful feeling, which I can only describe as a search for God. I say that that search for God was not reasoning, but a feeling, because that search proceeded not from the course of my thoughts, it was even directly contrary to them, but proceeded from the heart. It was a feeling of fear, orphanage, isolation in a strange land, and a hope of help from someone. Though I was quite convinced of the impossibility of proving the existence of a deity, Kant had shown, and I quite understood him, that it could not be proven, I had yet sought for God, hoping that I could find him, and from old habit addressed prayers to that which I had sought but had not found. I went over in my mind the arguments of Kant and Schopenhauer showing the impossibility of proving the existence of a god, and I began to verify those arguments and refute them. Cause, said I to myself, is not a category of thought such as our time and space. If I exist, there must be some cause of it, and a cause for causes. And that first cause of all is what men have called God. And I paused on that thought and tried with all my being to recognize the presence of that cause. And as soon as I acknowledged that there is a force in whose power I am, I at once felt that I could live. But I asked myself, what is that cause, that force? How am I to think of it? What are my relations to that which I call God? And only the familiar replies occurred to me. He is the creator and the preserver. This reply did not satisfy me, and I felt that I was losing within me what I needed for my life. I became terrified, and began to pray to him whom I sought, that he should help me. But the more I prayed, the more apparent it became to me that he did not hear me, and that there was no one to whom I could address myself. And with despair in my heart that there is no God at all, I said, Lord have mercy, save me, Lord teach me. But no one had mercy on me, and I felt that my life was coming to a standstill. But again and again, from varying sides, I returned to the same conclusion, that I could not have come into the world without any cause or reason or meaning. I could not be such a fledgling fallen from its nest as I felt myself to be. Or, granting that I be such, lying on my back crying in the high grass, even then I cry because I know a mother has borne me within her, has hatched me, warmed me, fed me, and loved me. Where is she, that mother? If I had been deserted, who has deserted me? I cannot hide from myself that someone bored me, loving me. Who was that someone? Again, God? He knows and sees my searching, my despair, and my struggle. He exists, said I to myself. And I had only for an instant to admit that, and at once life rose within me, and I felt the possibility and joy of being. But again, from the admission of the existence of a God, I went on to search my relation with him. And again I imagined that God, our Creator in three persons who sent his Son, the Savior, and again that God, detached from the world and from me, melted like a block of ice, melted before my eyes, and again nothing remained. And again the spring of life dried up within me, and I despaired and felt that I had nothing to do but kill myself. And worst of all was that I could not do it. Not twice or three times, but tens and hundreds of times I reached those conditions, first of joy and animation, and then of despair and consciousness of the impossibility of living. I remember that it was in early spring. I was alone in the woods listening to its sounds. I listened and thought ever of the same thing, 
as I had continually done during those last three years. I was again seeking God. Very well, there is no God, said I to myself. There is no one who is not my imagination but a reality like my whole life. He does not exist and no miracles can prove his existence because the miracles would be my imagination, besides being irrational. But my perception of God, of him whom I seek, I asked myself, where does that perception come from? And again at this thought, the glad waves of life rose within me. All that was around me came to life and received a meaning. But my joy did not last long. My mind continued its work. The conception of God is not God, said I to myself. The conception is what takes place within me. The conception of God is something I can evoke or can refrain from evoking in myself. That is not what I seek. I seek that without which there can be no life. And again, all around me and within me began to die, and again I wished to kill myself. But then I turned my gaze upon myself, on what went on within me, and I remembered all those cessations of life and reanimations that had reoccurred within me hundreds of times. I remembered that I only lived at those times when I believed in God. As it was before, so it was now. I need only be aware of God to live. I needed only to forget Him or disbelieve Him, and I died. What is this animation in dying? I do not live when I lose belief in the existence of God. I should long ago have killed myself had I not a dim hope of finding him. I live, really live, only when I feel him and seek him. What more do you seek? exclaimed a voice within me. This is he. He is that without which one cannot live. To know God and to live is one and the same thing. God is life. Live seeking God and then you will not live without God. And more than ever before, all within me and around me lit up, and the light did not again abandon me. And I was saved from suicide. When and how this change occurred in me I could not say. As imperceptibly and gradually the force of life in me had been destroyed, and I had reached the impossibility of living, a cessation of life, and the necessity of suicide, so imperceptibly and gradually did the force of life return to me. And strange to say that the strength of life which returned me was not new, but quite old, the same that had borne me along in my earliest days. I quite returned to what belonged to my earliest childhood and youth. I returned to the belief in that will which produced me and desired something of me. I return to the belief that the chief and only aim of my life is to be better, i.e., to live in accord with that will, and I return to the belief that I can find expression of that will in what humanity in the distant past hidden from has produced for its guidance. That is to say, I return to a belief in God, in moral perfection, and in a tradition transmitting the meaning of life. There was only this difference, that then all this was accepted unconsciously, while now I knew that without it I could not live. What happened to me was something like this. I was put into a boat, I do not remember when, and pushed off from an unknown shore, shown the direction of the opposite shore, had oars put in my unpracticed hands, and was left alone. I rowed as best as I could and moved forward, but the further I advanced towards the middle of the stream, the more rapid grew the current bearing me away from my goal, and the more frequently did I encounter others, like myself, borne away by the stream. There were few rowers who continued to row, there were others who had abandoned their oars, there were large boats and immense vessels full of people. Some struggled against the current, others yielded to it. And the further I went, the more, seeing the progress down the current of all those who were adrift, I forgot the direction given to me. In the very center of the stream, amid the crowds of boats and vessels which were being borne downstream, I quite lost my direction and abandoned my oars. Around me on all sides, with mirth and rejoicing, people with sails and oars were borne down the stream, assuring me and each other that no other direction was possible. And I believed them and floated with them. And I was carried far, so far that I heard the roar of the rapids in which I must be shattered, and I saw boats shattered in them, and I recollected myself. I was long unable to understand what had happened to me. I saw before me nothing but destruction, towards which I was rushing and which I feared. I saw no safety anywhere and did not know what to do, but looking back I perceived innumerable boats which unceasingly and strenuously pushed against the stream, and I remembered about the shore, the oars, and the direction, and began to pull back upwards against the stream and towards the shore. That shore was God, and the direction was tradition. The oars were the freedom given to me to pull for the shore and unite with God. And so the force of life was renewed in me, and I again began to live. End of chapter 12